You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 86 for June 8th, 2016. I'm your host, Chris Webster. On today's show, we talk about racism, ethnicity, and code switching. How do we fight our unconscious or conscious racism? So, go come up with some new non-racist jokes because you're better than that, and because the CRM Archaeology Podcast starts right now. Welcome to the show, everyone. Joining me today are Doug in Scotland. Hello. And Bill in Arizona. Good morning. All right, so we're going to start with a couple of updates. Let's go straight over to Bill real quick so he can tell us about his new book that's out. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just published another Kindle book. It's available online right now. You can download it on Amazon. It's called Becoming an Archaeologist, Crafting a Career in Cultural Resource Management. And obviously, if you uh, have been paying any attention, I I care a lot about archaeologists finding a job. And so um, the book is really a culmination of a whole bunch of stuff that I um, put together through conversations with other people, hiring managers, um, human resources folks. Uh, principal investigators that hire archaeologists, and I just put together a nice, slim uh, edition for anyone who wants to uh, try to find a job in archaeology. It's just kind of straight and to the point, like all my other books. And like I said, you can you can download it right now uh, on Kindle. It's seven dollars and ninety seven cents. Which, if you think about it, I know you'll get seven dollars worth of this book. So go ahead and check it out. Check out the comments. It's been live for a while, so I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, go check that out. Um, I had a chance to look at it before Bill put it out, and I, I picked up a free copy. Hopefully, he didn't miss that um, when, when he first released the book. So, uh, it's really good, and it's an excellent um, it's an excellent thing for people, I think, for people new in the field, and, and also for people who are, um, for lack of a better phrase, perhaps having a crisis of faith <laughs> about, their, about their existence in CRM. Yeah, exactly. Just like you said, the... Um if you if you ever wanted to be an archaeologist, you spent quite a bit of time going to school and getting your education, and then um, you did all the work to finally become an archaeologist, and then one day you actually are one. And so the question is, what do you do after that? We all hit this um, crisis point where you know we don't really know what to do next. So that's actually one of the things I spend a significant amount of time addressing in the book. So go check out that book. The uh, The link to that book is in the show notes. Uh, just click on that. It'll take you right over there. So check that out. It's a good read. Um, you can pick it up and read it on pretty much any device you have. So uh, it's pretty good. Now we're going to roll right into a an update for episode 85. We had some, we had, we had a couple different things we covered in that episode. Uh, it was called jobs, emails, and overtime. And Doug is good. Doug, Doug had some pretty good interactions on Facebook and the Archeo Field Text group about uh, something he brought up in particular. And uh, Doug's going to fill us back in on that now because none of us really had any, any real world experience with this. <laughs> and Doug got some, Doug got some uh, schooling, for lack of a better term, on uh, Facebook on, on what this is about. So, Doug, why don't you fill us in on the update on 85? Uh, I was going to start with the fun stuff first. <laughs> Go ahead and start with the fun stuff first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the fun stuff was, if if you guys remember in last episode, we were joking about how Chris was uh, was disappointed that he didn't get more comments on his uh, PCS things. And I joked that, you know, all you have to do is just say something <laughs> inflammatory and you'll get, you know, a bunch of, of comments. And so then right after that episode, I went and uh, I posted something about how, like, damn it, Chris, why aren't you... Uh, <laughs> setting rates for uh, job postings, blah, blah, blah. And now we're at 40 plus comments later. Um, whereas Chris's original one, Chris, did you even get any comments when you first? Posted? I don't know. Not very many. Probably not that much. No, because we, we just posted and said, hey, here's this. And we didn't we didn't really ask a question or anything. So, you know, it was um, and, and you know what Doug posted was about the first job post, which is a local job to Los Angeles, eighteen dollars an hour, no per diem. And the thing I think people had a problem with was the five years experience required at eighteen dollars an hour. Um, you know, because eighteen in California is kind of an entry level uh, wage. You know, and that's five years experience. You should be well into the early twenties, uh, twenty dollars an hour range in California anyway. So, 
Yeah, there's a lot of comments. A lot of good comments, too. We learned a lot. I learned a lot about how we can kind of restructure the PCS jobs board based on this. It, it looks like we really should start having minimums, but we're not really sure how to do that because the uni, you know, the United States is a really big country. And <laughs> there's even in California, even from city to city, you could have different standards for, you know, what a what a job should be making. And it's difficult for us to it's difficult for us to know that across the country because, you know, David Connolly commented that Badger does this, but Badger deals with a much smaller area as well. It's still a difficult question for them, you know, because there are distinct areas, I'm sure, but it's smaller and there's less. And I don't know. I don't know. Doug, it was a it was a good post, though, Doug, and it got people talking. Well, I think it was it was more for just fun to show that all you have to do to get uh, your post more uh, more views there, Chris, is just say something inflammatory. Nice. And, yeah, social media. <laughs> all right, continue on with the other discussion. Yeah. So the second one is a is a good point that um, another person brought up in the episode, and it was our discussion about. Well, it was mainly about emails, but we were, we were talking a lot about, you know, how to put together an email when you're trying to get a job, how to do an introductory email. And a comment I made was you need to consider, especially if you're from a minority group or a woman, what your public facing name is going to be. I did the suggestion that um, you may want to basically go by initials and thus not give away potentially your gender or what sort of ethnicity you are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, someone came back with a really good comment. Um, you know, not your typical Facebook comment, which usually starts with you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a really good comment. Um, I'm not going to name the person cause I'm not sure, you know, it is a closed Facebook group. So right. if you're an archaeo field text, you can find the post. Yeah, you could find it, but uh, if if not, it is a closed group, so I'm not sure if, if they yeah. really wanted to have their name put to it or not. Um, but basically, the person came back and said that they were really comp – well, actually, I said they said, I completely disagree uh, with encouraging minorities to disguise themselves as white men to get a job. Um, but they also said they, they get it. Uh, discrimination exists, uh, but we can't play that game. It goes against everything we should be working towards in this and related uh, scientific fields. Um, and then they went on to say, you know, I understand you're just trying to give applicants a fighting chance. I just don't agree with the sort of compromise, if it is a compromise at all. Um, and then they said, you know, good show and stuff like that. But it basically raised the issue of, you know, should you basically have to um, disguise your name because, you know, people are racist assholes or um and, and actually a lot of the evidence mainly shows that it's, it actually affects women the worst um so a lot of studies have done this where they basically send out um resumes identical resumes they change the name on it and the evidence is basically shown as if you have more of a traditional african-american sounding name even if you have the exact same qualifications um you get less less interviews and mm -hmm. same goes with women. If you have a, you know, a fairly gender specific to women name, like, you know, Sarah or something like that. And you have the exact same, um, you know, resume, so like they'll, they'll change stuff, but like the experience will be the same. The years will be the same, all that stuff. Um, you won't get as many callbacks for a job as you would if you had the name John. Right. Um, I, th I hope we got across the point that uh, on the last episode, that is a real, a real crap situation um, that, you know, you have to disguise yourself um, to get a job. So I guess it's basically just sort of opening up to you guys to sort of see about what you think about it. Um, I, I'm really glad that the person realized that the advice we were giving is, um, you know, how to get a job. Mm hmm. Um, but there's the situation basically, and I guess the, the discussion should be is, should we be taking a stand? Um, well, I guess we definitely should be taking a stand. That's not the question. It's should you, I mean, how do we deal with this in archeology? span mm -hmm. How do you deal with the fact that if you send in your, your resume and it doesn't have, um, you know, if you've made it gender neutral 
or ethnic neutral or whatever you want to call it. Um, is that a good thing, a bad thing? Um, how do you deal with that? So I'll open up to you guys. Well, I'll, I'll jump in because I don't have a lot to say on it being an average, you know, I guess technically middle aged at 41. I don't know. Is that middle, uh, uh, white guy. Um, I, I have zero experience with that. You know, I, if I've experienced discrimination, it's probably because of my attitude and they already knew me, <laughs> you know, they were like Chris Webster, fuck that guy and threw my CV in the trash. Um, but, uh, so I don't know. And, and as a, as a job creator, as a, as a business owner, um, I mean, I, it's not even, maybe it's because I'm on this podcast or whatever. I don't know, but I, I don't, it, it wasn't even a thought in my head until you mentioned it, um, Doug, you know, as far as, as far as discriminating, but a lot of discrimination is so subconscious and people don't even know they're doing it sometimes, you know, they might just, if they've got two names in front of them and you know, their brain is going to subconsciously choose one over the other if they're, if their credentials are equal and they don't even realize it, maybe, um, I don't know. And maybe us talking about it will help them realize, Hey, I'm doing that. But then again, if you've got two people, you know, should you use some, and, and they're, they have equal experience, equal qualifications and, and everything they're, they're equal in every respect, which is relatively impossible. But if that situation came up and one of them is, you know, a native American female and the other one is a white male, you know, which one are you going to choose as likely a white male making the decision, you know, should you use a, say a random, you know, number generator or something like that? Because you're going to choose one of them. You can only hire one. And what do you base that on? And that's, that's where your bias comes in. So I don't know, Bill, have you had any experience with this? Well, yeah, I've had experience. I don't know if I can actually talk about all of it, but, um, uh, that's why it's so important for you to, if you're going for a job, to not be the cold call. Because if you are putting, you know, if, if you're showing your personality and matching your um, your skills and knowledge and stuff like that to a face or, or a personality, it won't matter what the individual's name is, right? Mm -hmm. If they've been doing the proper networking and they've been, you know, doing everything they can to talk to people at the company and they see the person's name in there, then they're like, oh, yeah, you know, actually this may benefit them. I don't know, but it may benefit them more if they have a unique name because if you've met the person and you've talked to them and their name is Bill White, which I already know <laughs> three archaeologists named Bill White, they'll be like, well, which one? Well, wait, what? Who's that guy, right? <laughs> but if you do have an interesting name or an ethnic name and you've done the same thing, they'll be, oh, yeah, I remember him. Yeah, I remember that guy. I remember his name. So maybe a unique name might help you in that situation. But going back to the Native American thing, I've actually seen it happen both ways where they either do or do not want Native Americans. If there's a chance for um, burials, there might be a motivation to not have Native Americans because of a just a totally imaginary and, you know, not really uh, not really data based decision that maybe Native Americans would not want to excavate. Um, right. uh, human remains or even remains of their ancestors for whatever reason. Right. So archaeologists have all kinds of different um, motivations behind how they make these decisions. So there might be some kind of a motivation that, yeah, we've got to have Native Americans on the team because, you know, uh, this is their heritage and they rightfully have a chance to work. And if they have the right qualifications, we're going to hire uh, Native Americans if we can. Mm -hmm. There also might be a motivation that Oh, you know, in this culture area, they have a history of not wanting to have their remains repatriated because of their spiritual beliefs. So therefore, we'll be more reluctant to hire people from that tribe to work here, right? And, you know, those those decisions go on behind closed doors. So whether it's your name or your identity or your ethnicity or whatever, um, there's not a hiring manager out there that's going to say, yeah, we didn't hire her because of this or, you know, we didn't hire him because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it turns into that, um, that uh, background discrimination that's almost impossible to find, you know, and that's what really the, mo the, um, the uh, protest against discrimination, you know, the Black Lives Movement and stuff, mm -hmm. and its core fundamentals, that's what they're really trying to get at. The behind the scenes discrimination that's just embedded in our society and in our industries and, uh, you know, it's, it's hard for people to recognize that. It's hard for you to actually point that out specifically. This is racism right here. This is discrimination. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the commenter's right that we should be fighting against that. 
but I also see where, you know, uh, Doug was justified in, in trying to tell it how it is. And, you know, I'm not white, so they would never say those kind of things in front of me. But I can definitely see that going on in somebody's mind when they read that resume. I might have like a completely more extreme view. I actually think a big problem with this is um, HR in sense like if you go to really big organizations, it should your resume should go through an HR department, which would strip out all that information. Um, and so at really big organizations, if you get a resume, it shouldn't have any of that. Um, but the problem is, is archaeology is mainly small organizations. And I, it would be great if – it may not be practical for every small organization, but if they had one person who got resumes and then stripped out all that information or asked that information not to be given because I've, I've given advice to students and students will put on their – like their birth date mm -hmm. on their uh, resumes. And the problem is, is depending on what country you are or what state, um, that is horrendous. You have just opened up you, – you almost – you basically – a lot of organizations would rather bin your, uh, you know, just toss away your resume than have to worry about that because you've just given away your age or maybe your your gender stuff, and you've potentially opened up that organization to a lawsuit. Um, obviously, those lawsuits are there because of you know general discrimination. But when people put on stuff like, you know, I was born in like 1995 or something like that, which so I'm, I'm dealing with like university students, so that's you know the age they are at the moment, but. <laughs> Um, it's a huge like red flag. Um, and some organizations I do know will toss out, uh, CVs and stuff just so they don't open themselves up to a lawsuit. Hmm. Um, but I honestly think a, one way to do it was act would be actually to basically, um, strip away all sort of information like that age, gender, um, you know, stuff like that. And it's not exactly possible because you, you'll see resumes someone's been working for like 20 years and you can roughly estimate that, you know, they're a certain age or something like that. But um, I personally think that that should be it because there are a lot of subconscious things that people don't really know. And I actually have to say the worst people are probably the people who think they don't discriminate. Mm -hmm. The ones who are just like, oh, no, I've, I've never discriminated against anyone. They don't actually recognize that they have, you know these preconceived notions of what people are and what they do and they apply that blindly and they, yeah. made it, they probably did it subconsciously. Um, so I don't know. I, and I also like, I get where the person's coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think it puts a lot of pressure, you know, on minority groups, be that, you know, your sexuality, your gender, um, your ethnicity, anything like that to basically be more than just an archeologist. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, I saw this great talk, and I can't mention names because the archaeologist works in a country where it's illegal to be gay. Um, but he basically, his talk started out with, I actually really hate being here. Um, <laughs> I don't want to be an ambassador. He, d he didn't want to be the gay face of archaeology. He just wanted to be an archaeologist. Yeah. Um, he, just, he didn't want people to look at him and have to be like, you know, um, you know, I don't, he didn't really want, he just wanted to be an archaeologist. He didn't want to have that to be an issue that he has to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, it's putting a lot of pressure on a lot of groups um, who are underrepresented in archaeology, which is basically everyone who's not white or male. Mm -hmm. um, so it's starting to become a more female based um, profession to be like that sort of token person who, you know, is the ambassador for whatever group they're from. Uh, I don't know if that's fair or not. I don't know. Your guys' thoughts? Yeah, Bill, real quick. Yeah, it does change the dynamics of the workforce and, and the workflow. And, uh, you know, um, it, it changes what people say and what they think and, and, and how they think. And sometimes you can use that to a good, you know, to your own benefit because you can get them to stop thinking about just – really generic stuff that they've been saying for a long time. But uh, other times it makes an uncomfortable situation where your employer, or your coworkers actually don't really know what to say. And so they're just kind of like, you know, I don't like working with that guy and they can't really explain why, 
And the reason why is because they can't just be a sexist pig or just say any old annoying racist joke and laugh about it. They have to actually use their brain and be all PC and that makes them feel uncomfortable. So, uh, yeah, as being pretty much the only black archaeologist, like all the time, unless I recruit other archaeologists to work with me that are black. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's definitely, that, that definitely changes everything. And, uh, you are expected to be an example and, and they're, you know, everybody around you every single minute is totally thinking that, you know, they always want to know what you have to say. They're thinking, oh, well, he's just saying that because, you know, he's got this background and everything. And, uh, yeah, so it, it yeah. changes things. It change. It's a lonely place to be. Okay. Well, we're going to, we're going to move on to our next segment. I'll just wrap by saying, you know, especially as somebody who might be subject to those unconscious biases, you know, that we need to work to change our, our unconsciousness, um, if you will, um, because, or our subconscious really, uh, and part of the ways we do that is, you know, I mean, I'm I'm totally guilty of this. In fact, when I was in the Navy, um, I worked with this guy who was black, and he started this with me. You know, it was the two of us working really closely together a lot for about six months. And he came in and he told this, I can't even remember what it was because this was like over 20 years ago, but he told this white joke. And uh, it was hilarious. And, um, you know, he asked me if I knew any black jokes, and I was like 19 and really uncomfortable with doing that. And, and, and then... By the time we both got, well, by the time he got me over that, we came in and told these racist jokes about each other like every single day. And <laughs> that's just what we did. But I think, I think even doing it in a, in a joking sort of way, even with your close friends and family, you know, even with people that are of the ethnicity or gender or whatever, or, you know, whatever that you're joking with, I think that stuff helps to reinforce those, those subconscious biases that you're not worried about. You're like, oh, I can joke about it since I, because I'm not racist, but, you know, when it comes down to making the decision between two people, you're going to make a decision and it's going to be based on your biases. So, um, all right, so let's wrap this. We went a little long on this one and, uh, we're going to come back, but first here's a quick ad for the PCS videos. Um, we've talked about PCS a lot and I'm still hammering it in. So we've got a nice little ad here about our videos. Um, as of time of recording, we've got 11 up on the website with more on the way, probably maybe even 12 or 13 by the time this podcast comes out. So, Check it out, give us some feedback, and go subscribe to our YouTube page. Back in a minute. Professional Certifications for Scientists, or PCS, aims to provide practical educational videos, field guides, knowledge tests, professional certifications, and deployment connections to professional scientists everywhere. Check out the videos page for high-quality training videos on a variety of topics. Find PCS videos at www pcscourses.com forward slash videos pcs a place for good scientists to become great science professionals all right we're back and we've been having a good discussion over the break um about names and uh and things like that and uh bill why don't you kick it off and and uh sort of give a synopsis of what we were talking about and we'll dig into it yeah we were talking about names and how they can you know, affect you in your professional career. Um, I, uh, it's actually something that some black families um, consider when their kid is born. I know in the case of my family, uh, my dad is, so there's not really a heritage in, the, in my family of naming people ethnic names necessarily, uh, even though we're African American. Uh, but I know that Father and sister specifically, uh, non-ethnic names because they want. We were we lived in Idaho, and they wanted to make sure that there wasn't really confusion over their name. Or also, uh, they recognized that naming uh, just specifically naming their child a black name in Idaho is like a magnet for every kind of deep-seated concern or fear or thing they'd seen on TV or the internet or something like that about black people, and so. Uh, you know, we were basically the only blacks really, you know, to, there was a few black people in my school in Boise, Idaho, actually going back there. Now there's more blacks than I've ever seen in my life before. I thought I was like, wow, I think there's maybe 1% black people now in this town <laughs> before, like the only people in my school that were black were my brothers and sisters or, you know, relatives. There wasn't mm -hmm. anyone else there, but, um, yeah, just, Growing up in that kind of a place, my parents were absolutely aware of what they were doing when they named us. And so, you know, I'm named after my father. That's just a, it's a family name. But my brother and sister, they all got names. Um, 
that were just uh, either from the Bible or just traditional American English names, vernacular names. Uh, I actually have two sisters. So my half sister, my full sister, and my brother, my mom and dad specifically did not choose ethnic names, even though they were, um, there were potentially, you know, options for our names because they were afraid that we would be judged by the rest of society. Yeah. So the original comment I had uh, on last episode basically came out of that sort of, um, Bill's experience only it was from my wife. So my wife, that's that's how I learned to do just initials for your 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 first name. So my wife's name is Kwanya. Um and actually it's it's a completely um made up name. So she has two older twin sisters, Sonia and Tanya, and uh when her mom had her her sisters were seven or eight and asked to name the kid. And so seven and eight year olds named a rhyming name as they would. Um but basically my wife now goes by professionally on her email q.l.huff because as soon as you say her name, Kwanya, I, I go through pretty much almost universally the same conversation with about 90% of people, which is, oh, that's a very interesting name. Where is it from? Well, it's my wife's name. Yeah, yeah, but where'd <laughs> she get that from? Um, the United States. Oh, but where in the United States? Texas. <laughs> oh, so your wife's from Texas. Yes, she's from Texas. Oh, but where's her family from? Texas. No, 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 no. Where is her family from? Texas. They're from Texas, people. <laughs> and, but I know what they're trying to get at. I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm just being difficult. What they're really trying to ask is, is she black? Mm -hmm. And eventually I, I, I tell them, but they'll be like, no, no, no. Where, where's your wife? Where did their family come from before they went to you know the United States? Uh, I'm just like... Well, we don't know that. That was kind of taken from them with that whole slavery thing. Um, at which point, I do that mainly just to embarrass people. Um, but they all, pretty much 90% of the conversations I have when I bring up her name are people trying to fish and confirm their suspicion that she's black. Um, and it is one of those things. So she has professionally decided that um, it's it's just easier than being prejudged. Um, uh, that you know, she puts that on her resume, she puts it on her email, and so far been fairly successful um, getting jobs. But it is one of those things where, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of of issues and issues with discrimination. I would say aren't just based on you know race, sexuality. There's a lot of class. So um, over here in the UK, where it's a pretty homogenous group, despite what like the right wing fascists believe um, the UK is, is 87% white um, and Scotland where I live is 95, 97% white. So you have really homogenous groups, but even then people still find ways to discriminate. So um, a story which everyone will stay anonymous in um, basically this one person was going for a job and they by far had the most qualifications of anyone who went for the job. And they didn't get the job because they said, didn't he know? Which is a Scot very Scottish way of saying, I don't know. Um, but it showed that they possibly were working class. And so this is a job in heritage. They didn't get it because the people basically thought that they were, oh, working class, not sophisticated enough to you know, dare to uh, to dig holes. So, um, yeah, I'd say names matter. But even then, um, there's many other aspects that people discriminate against, be it your class or even just sort of your accents. So uh, in the United States, um, most people from the South will tell you that um, they definitely did get discriminated against just for having that Southern accent, which, you know, people just automatically assume that there's some sort of redneck kick. Um, Mind you, don't you know? Not caring that they may have like a PhD or anything like that. There's just a sort of preconceived discrimination against you know different groups. Yeah, the, the accent thing is really huge because my dad's from North Carolina, and um, uh, he spent a lot of time and effort 
uh, doing his best to change his North Carolina accent when he came out West. Um, well, for a while they lived in New York too. So, uh, our family, my mom and dad lived in New York for a while. And uh, my brother was actually born there. Um, and they would make fun of him for that country accent. And so he had a college degree and he didn't want, um, he didn't want people to, you know, think he was stupid or anything less. So he just basically code switched. And so he learned how to speak actual, you know, standard English to the best that he possibly could. But then when he'd go back home around the other North Carolina folks, the whole accent would come back. And I remember they, my parents would not answer us if we said, you know, Ebonics type stuff or slang or anything like that. They would just, you know, I don't want to hear, I don't know what you're talking about. Say it right. Say it right. And so, um, you know, from a, a young age, we also learned to code switch too. So when you're hanging out with your friends, when you're with family and, you know, in the South, you just switch your, switch your accent or what you're saying to speak with them so they can actually understand it. And then when you're at work or anywhere else, do your best to speak proper English so that white people don't judge or basically so that you sound like you're more educated. Yeah. Co code switching is a, is a pretty big, pretty big deal in archeology span in the, uh, in the UK. So, um, and it, it mainly comes down to accents because in a sense you can't, you know, when you're all in, you know, your gear and in the mud, um, you can't really tell people's different classes and stuff across, but, Essentially, most people from North North England, um, especially code switch a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I've had this conversation with many different people. Is that they don't, you know, they they lighten up their uh, their their northern accent a lot. Um, I've, I've known several people like so. I spent some time in Newcastle, which has a very very distinct accent. Um, but again, most of the people I know there do code switching. So when they go to work. They have a very different accent than what they do when they speak at home. Nowadays, archaeology is realizing that perhaps we should talk to the people who are at those sites to maybe tell us a little bit more about the past that's not in these newspaper articles or not, you know, already uh, reported in ethnography. So in the process, archaeologists are trying to build relationships with the people who live near the sites or live in the culture area. And that means talking with them, right? But... Uh, it, there's a full awareness that we cannot speak in academies, the language that we would speak, you know, back at the university or maybe even in the office. I guess if you're a super nerd, you're still using archaeo speak when you're actually not at the site. But um, uh, anyway, realizing that we've got to adopt some kind of vernacular that's associated with the people who live there, but we're stumbling over ourselves. And, you know, there's an element of authenticity, right? So, in the process of trying to uh, adopt their um, intonation and uh, their uh, accent from that area, you are basically, they can see right through that, that you're trying to, um, uh, that you're trying to uh, uh, befriend yourself to them uh, in the way that they understand. And so it's going to go two ways. Either it's going to go bad and you're going to look like a clown and everybody's going to not like you, or they'll commend your effort for trying and, and uh, you know, that'll kind of endear you a little bit more to them. But I think really just the trying to be sincere to what you're doing and, and do the best within your own um, within your own ability to try and get their um, point across and give them a chance to speak and comment on sites. That's really the key. Um, rather than trying to adopt some kind of crazy South Carolina accent because you're – or Gullah accent because you're working with – black people on the sea islands just be yourself you know you're going to stick out but, but i do see it quite a bit where um you know non-ethnic people are trying to adopt the accent of the people that they're working with and just it comes across bad though so, so we've been talking going that way but what what uh, the whole comment that started this whole sort of conversation was should should it be should it go that way should we not how do we – well, I guess the question is, is code switching okay? And if it's not, how do we, how do we deal with that issues as archaeologists to make sure that people can be themselves without you know, uh, discriminating against them in certain ways? I mean basically the whole comment that came from Facebook was uh, they didn't really agree with the, the concept of code sw switching. Um, 
Well, I think, in, in my opinion, it's it's honestly, uh, it's a public perception sort of thing, um, which is, you know, based on, uh, you know, our media, our movies and things like that. People who, I mean, you hear somebody, let's, let's, let's face it, you know, you hear somebody from, you know, from the deep south and they're talking with this accent, you instantly think that, okay, this person's ignorant and they're not going to understand what I'm talking about, right? Um, you hear somebody from, we hear somebody in the United States with a, with a British accent and we think they're intelligent. <laughs> I mean, we think they're intelligent and sophisticated. It doesn't make any sense. And that's the, that's the foundation of, of this whole code switching thing. We think that to, to sound smart and intelligent, like you know what you're talking about, you have to speak a certain way. And that's the, that's the first thing that's the first thing we need to do is learn how to, uh, and I, I mean, I'm guilty of this, obviously. Um, I think everybody probably is, but the first thing we need to do is learn how to, um, judge somebody for lack of a better word on their merits and on their qualifications and on their actions versus what they sound and look like, you know, and act like and things like that. So, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the brunt of it right there. As far as I can see, you guys, agree or disagree <laughs> yeah and well we also need to acknowledge there's different ways of knowing you know people who mm-hmm. uh, are from the south you know even if they haven't gone to college or they haven't done any of the stuff that we would as- um, associate with intelligence they know a lot you know they're not just you know ignorant rubes just because of the way that they talk even if they mm-hmm. actually are behaving that way or whatever they have a vernacular knowledge that's rooted in their experience and their culture you know it's, it's really our our duty as anthropologists to acknowledge that value and if it relates with our research or it can further uh, cultural resources or any of the stuff you know that we do as crmers harness that rather than just discounting them you know harness that doug what are your thoughts on that uh well i was going to slightly go somewhere different but just like also within archaeology there tends to be a lot of um vernacular discrimination um and it, it works both ways. So there's a really good blog post, and I'll, I'll put the link to it from Sarah Perry, who has a very um, a very type of vernacular, which is very academic. But that's who she is. Um, but she's been criticized mainly from you know your your sort of commercial archaeologists, your your CRMists who are just like, uh, why are you being so pretentious? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not she's not a pretentious person. That's just she talks, that's the way she's talked. She's always talked that way. Um, but it also, I've, I've seen it go the other way, um, where I don't mean to call people out on this, but I've, I've seen quite a few people who at, and it's particularly bad at academic conferences where they'll throw out every big word that they could possibly think of, um, as sort of a way to set themselves apart and basically talk down to other people. Um, uh, the people will just go off on, oh, you know, Freudian theory on blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, I understood there was an is and there was an a, um, but the rest of the <laughs> words, I have no clue what you're talking about. I, I've, I've now gotten to the habit of calling people out and I actually mm-hmm. calling them out's not the right way. I basically say, you've completely lost me. I don't understand what those words are. And that's because I have a very, a fairly simple um, vocabulary. I mean, if you if anyone's read my blog or anything like that, um, it tends to be very. People would call it very. I've, I've had someone say, "Oh, it's it's so web friendly." Um, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, thank you. That's, yeah. that's a good way of saying that I, I dumb it down." But that's that's how I talk. That's not that's how I comprehend things. Um, nice. And part of that has. Well, to, hey, Doug. Yeah. Doug, Doug, let's go to a break real quick and we'll come back and finish this up because I've got some stuff to talk about conference speak and paper speak as well. We're going to take a break real quick for a short business tip uh, again from Heritage Business International. Check out their website in the show notes. We'll be right back in a minute. Hi, everyone. This is Christopher Dorr with Heritage Business International. And here's this week's Heritage Business Tip from the archive. This week, we look at the importance of retention. Client retention is one of the most important overlooked aspects of heritage organizations. It can be demonstrated mathematically that retaining an existing client is far more valuable than winning a new client. You must track your retention rate. The formula is easy, but most heritage organizations don't do it correctly. Retention rate equals clients at risk 
divided by clients at risk retained. What's a client at risk? If you have finished all the work for a client in a given year, they are at risk. If they hire you again the next year, then they are retained. If they don't, they are lost. To receive our most up-to-date heritage business tips, you can subscribe to our free weekly email at heritagebusiness.org. Until next time, this is Christopher Dorr. Okay, we're back. And Doug, you were talking about uh, some conference speak and and paper speak and the the terminology used in those. Go ahead and continue. Yeah, well, I was just going to say is like, I have a very um, <laughs> web friendly, as it was called, uh, voice. Um, but that is there's, there's a couple of reasons behind that. One is um, I have dyslexia, so spelling very long, complicated words is not something I can do. Um, so essentially, I my my written vocabulary reflects the words that I can spell, um, mm-hmm. which narrows it down. And then also, in a sense, um, it's a bit of where I grew up as well. Um, New Mexico, 49th, 48th, 50th, depends on the year, poorest state. <laughs> um, like, yeah, we, most of the people, so like in my high school, which at one point was one of the lar- like 16th largest in the, uh, in the U.S., uh, my, my class, my, my freshman year class, had 1,100 students. Only 600, some of them graduated. Wow. Um, yeah, like we, like you didn't, my vocabulary is very much a product of where I grew up, which is um, somewhat slang, somewhat, um, yeah, we don't throw out very large words, mainly because throwing out very large words was a good way to get your ass kicked. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was, you know, that's, that's sort of a product where I'm from, but yeah, people, people speak different ways from different reasons. Um, and I have to basically, when I go to conferences, just tell people, you know, I don't understand most of what you say, mainly because I haven't been exposed to those words and, um, that's not how I speak. So I need to put it, I need people to put it in terms I can understand. Well, it's also a good way to make them show you they know what they're talking about i don't understand that will you please explain it to me i mm-hmm. don't understand that just keep saying it until they realize that they don't actually command they don't grasp the concept either well it, here's the thing that really gets me about that too about conference speak is i i don't know when this started i don't know when it started that people would actually write a paper because people even say i even say this even though i don't actually write papers for conferences i write presentations um but I'll tell someone, oh, I'm giving a paper at the essays next year. I'm not giving a paper. I'm, I'm, I'm relaying some information to you in a conversational tone because that's what we're there for. If I wanted to, if I wanted to spend $1,500 to go to the SAAs to hear papers, I'll just read about it when you publish it, right? Like, I don't need to go there and hear you read something. I can do that, um, you know, when you actually come out with the information. But what I want to hear is an update on your research in a conversational tone. And you can tell... You can tell the people who have been doing this for a long time, who have been in this for 30 years, they will typically go up there and they will not use any notes. They will not use anything. They'll stand over by the PowerPoint. They'll point at stuff and they'll, they'll be interactive and they'll really get you involved. Those are the really good presentations that I like to hear. The ones that go up there and read papers, they read papers that they wrote that are like papers. And I, I'm fine with having jargon and big words in a, in, a, in a journal or publication because I can read that at my own pace. And if I don't understand what it is, I can go look it up, right? I can go find out what it is. I can look at their references. I can look at whatever I want. But in a conference, I don't want you to stand up there and read some jargon-filled paper. I want you to give me an update on your research. I want you to give me an update on what you've discovered, what you've found, what your, you know, what your remarks are. In, in a conversational tone, because that's why we're all there. That's why we all flew a thousand miles to find out. That's why we all paid $300 a night to stay at a Disney freaking hotel is not to hear you read a paper, but to, you know, to have a conversation with you. And that's, I don't know, that's, that's the way I've always seen conferences. And I try to get it back to that with my presentations. And I, if I, if I run a session, I try to tell people, Hey, don't write a paper, write a presentation with a bunch of pictures in your PowerPoint and no text. <laughs> Just do that. Know the material and give it to us. Doug. Hey, Chris, I'm going to add some nuance to that. So uh, 
being over being over in Europe, I I a lot of people English isn't their first language, so I completely understand them writing out the paper and then reading it off. I would if I tried to, I could never give you know deliver a paper in Spanish. I would write that thing out like and just monotone robot that thing just to make sure I didn't make a fool of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it is, I, I would say, you, you know, there are people who definitely, I mean, it's incredibly intimidating. And then also, uh, especially a lot of younger archeologists who are giving their first, um, first presentation or people, even older archeologists who have you know, been doing it for a while, you know, it, it can be, public speaking can be incredibly nerve wracking for people. Mm-hmm. And for some people, reading it out is the only way they can get up there without, you know, having a panic attack. And actually, I've, I've known several art, art, um, archaeologists who have had panic attacks giving papers. Um, oh, yeah. I because, saw one. Yeah. Yeah. It's because they stress out so much and they just can't do public speaking. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's one of those things like most people's work slash universities won't pay for anyone to go to a conference unless they go and present. So it's, it puts people in a lot of things. So I, I, I'd say, yes, definitely some of the best presentations I've ever seen are ones that are definitely not written out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think um, you, we have to, we shouldn't say don't ever do that. I think there are some very good reasons and good, very good situations where people definitely should consider writing out a paper if it helps them with, you know, anxiety or, you know, whatever language they're delivering it in isn't their first. Um, but and then I guess, yes. Yeah. So, so two things on that. First, first, I agree. You're totally right, Doug, is that, you know, people are often required to present and they just don't know how to do it because we're not trained to do that in college. You know, it's like a lot of the training issues we talk about. We're not trained to do a lot of stuff that we are required to do for our jobs, um, like leadership and things like that. We're just not given that education. And, so you're right. You know, people don't understand how to do public speaking. It might be the first time they've spoken in front of a crowd versus, you know, a crowd that wasn't like, you know, classroom type of thing. Um, and, and a crowd of people they don't know. And, and when you go to a big conference like the SAAs or the SHAs, you know, it's a crowd of your peers. And you know that these people in the audience know what the hell you're talking about. And they might call you out on it if you if you <laughs> if you misspeak. Right. I mean, it's a tough crowd. So. You have to know, and that could cause a lot of anxiety, man. I saw a kid totally freeze up on the on the lectern, just completely, you know. I mean, he froze up. They had to catch him, actually, because he started to fall over. And his professor got up there and finished his presentation wonderfully. You know, the guy did just what I said earlier. Um, but the other thing is, I think uh, I think I'm going to announce right now for SA 2017 that maybe Dig Tech will start a service where we give presentations for people, and uh, you know, just send us your PowerPoint and your notes uh, two months ahead of time, so we can uh, so we can take a look at it. And you hire us to give your presentation, and we'll get your message out there, so you don't have to freeze up on the lectern. It's either that or learn how to be a scientist. Learn how to be learn how to do science communication. Sci- Scientific American actually has a lot of stuff on that on their podcast series about about uh, about science communication and how scientists are so bad about that. Now they typically talk about like physicists and chemists and things like that, the guys that are stuck in the lab all the time. But you know, it's a it's a big deal if we're if we're constantly doing these things that are great for the public to know about, but we don't know how to tell them about it, then they're never going to know. And the only thing they're going to know is that that janky ass headline that that's been, you know, clickbaited for them that that's not even close to what they they intended to say. So um, and, and Bill's commenting in the background here that I'm going to robot the presentations for people. I don't robot presentations, <laughs> Bill. I don't know if you've ever seen one of my conference presentations. But I don't well, read. <laughs> I think I dozed off because it was so boring. But oh, Jesus. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. But you can't, you cannot read someone else's paper. I wouldn't read somebody else's paper. I would present somebody else's ideas. <laughs> uh, going back to the paper, I always write a paper because it uh, it's the foundation for an article. But yeah. also, um, just only recently, so I've gone to the SA. SHA, I think every single year, except for a couple of years, I don't know, this is like my 10th or 11th SHA this last year. And only the last couple of times have I finally moved away from reading the paper. Mm-hmm. It took me that long. And I spent all this time practicing it. You know, I basically knew everything on every slide and I still read the paper because there was a feeling that that's what you're expected to do. 
because you see your professors do it. You see company owners, everybody else. These guys all know they can easily just give that talk. Instead, they read the paper. And so there's just kind of a culture that you will read it. I hope that people who are listening out here, I just saw the light a few years ago. You don't have to read it anymore. If that's your language and you can speak it and you did the research, just tell me about it. Bill, do you think your experiences on your blog and the podcast have helped you come to that realization and be more communicative from a conversational standpoint? Uh, yeah, getting punched around on a, on social media. Yeah, that definitely made me <laughs> desensitized. You know, when you hear someone you kind of actually admire say that you're a fool because of something you wrote, and then you see that guy in the audience, you're kind of like, oh yeah, well here I am now. Say it now. No, yeah, yes, I would say that doing this every other week for three or four years has helped a lot. What are you guys' like thoughts on? So, like, I mean, we sort of we've gone off a bit on like presenting with papers, but the original comment was sort of, you know, people using, you know, much a different language to present. And I, I, I've heard the argument, people are like, oh, you know, journal articles um, need to be very, very technical and stuff like that. And I understand stuff like that, like lithic. I don't know. It seems like what are your thoughts on all these different words we use that separate us out? And do you guys think there's actually much room for diversity and voices in in archaeology, because you know, basically, uh, I'm actually still bitter about this. So yeah, you might, it might just be being bitter. But I actually once got a peer review back from a paper where someone said um, they really disliked my folksy um, writing. <laughs> um, because, yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't technical enough uh, for them. Jesus. And I used it, yeah, but I, I, I wonder. If if this whole thing with code switching and stuff, where we you know we switch on for archaeologists and we switch on for conferences and stuff, um, I wonder if we don't really allow for enough diversity in just talking, presenting, um, writing in archaeology. What are you guys' thoughts? No, we, we don't. We don't. And I I write one way for the blog, and then I do my best to take a. Um, sanitary wipe that can kill off the most powerful MRSA and then I turn what I actually think into just totally boring um jargony technical you know stuff so that the journal will publish it mm -hmm. I mean people read the blog post they don't have any problem with that they don't have any problem giving me their vernacular opinion on it and I I have I don't really necessarily hold back too much in the ebooks that I write either but to get published in an academic journal, yeah, yeah, you you turn it turn the pressure cooker on high and burn it until it's like flavorless, and then put it in the journal. Well, and they this... publish it, and they and they they jump up and down like, oh my god, this is amazing because two pages out of your twenty pages had some other kind of like take on an existing thought that we already had thought of like sixty years ago, but you wrote it in a very interesting way. Let's publish this whole damn thing. So this goes back to what I was talking about conferences, Bill. If you, um, you know, you, you say that you write a paper for your conference, right? But do you nowadays, you know, in the last few years, you, you might still write a paper because that's the foundation for your thought process, right? That's the foundation for your research. But, but at the conference level, you're not going to read that paper now. You're going to present those ideas in a conference style format that'll actually get people engaged and get people listening. I think it's the same for academic journals. If you're writing a paper for the Journal of Archaeological Science, you better damn well have your jargon down because that is a peer reviewed journal and it needs to be reproducible, right? Your results need to be reproducible. So you need to have all your ducks in a row. You need to have all your methodology down. You need to say why you came up with what you did, how you did what you did. But if you're going to take that same research and present it on a blog post, well, you, you might not have to do all that. You're just going to be conversational in your blog post and say, hey, we went over, we did this and this and this. What do you guys think? You know, And then if you go present that at a conference or you go present that at a at a high school or you go present that in a college classroom, you're going to have that same presentation done up 25 different ways because of your audience. And I think it's the same for academic journals. You know, Doug, if you're if your journal article was too folksy, maybe that maybe that reviewer is just, you know, too much of a staunchy academic and they couldn't see behind it. But, you know, or maybe you were trying to put that in the wrong journal. You know, maybe you need to put it in a journal that will allow that sort of language and not a journal. I mean, I don't know anything about what you were trying to present or the journal, but 
to me, it's like, look at like, if I was to present the same article in American antiquity versus the journal of archeological science, just to use those two, I, I have to imagine that those two articles would be written very differently just from the fact that they have different requirements for how the articles are structured. Right. So you got to follow that. You may as well follow your own personal requirements for the audience that you're speaking to, you know? So it's all about, yeah, it's then, all about figuring out who your audience is. But then we're reinforcing. So this is, this is the main comment. Yeah, this is back to our, the very beginning of this whole conversation is well, good. We're reinforcing <laughs> the status quo. Mm-hmm. And you're saying that one thing has more value for an audience than another. Um, and and sometimes I feel like we do we do put up barriers. So I'll, I'll use the perfect term, lithic. Every archaeologist knows what a lithic is. Mm-hmm. It's just another word for stone tool. And when we use it, it means that 99.99999, I don't know, everyone who's not an archaeologist will almost not know what a lithic is. I mean, other than some people who are interested in archaeology um, as a pastime, will know what that is. But, mm-hmm. you know, no one no one uses the term lithic. They would use it to describe stone tools. And that's when you see, like, panels at museums that are, well, actually, it's, it's really interesting when you go to certain museums because certain countries, they basically read, like, archaeological journals. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, you know, you go to some museums in Italy, and I completely understand it, but I'm like, God, no one else in their, their right mind would be able to understand what this panel's <laughs> about. Um, but, I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of feel that we've, we're have we cutting ourselves off from a wider audience mm-hmm. by specifically reinforcing these um, these sort of cultural norms inside these different groups. Yeah. Bill, any final thoughts on this? I once, I once had a supervisor who told me that I should write my reports as if they're going to be read by a nine-year-old. Because yeah. if you have a fifth grade um, like reading comprehension, I guess that's fourth grade reading comprehension, then you can understand what archaeology, what's going on in archaeology. And I think that that's the same thing um, when it comes to the code switching and... Uh, you know, how we use our names or whatever. Um, people are trying to figure out things that they probably were trying to figure out as far as race and ethnicity back when they were, you know, elementary school kids, when they got past that honeymoon period where everybody was equal, and they started to realize that their parents and society were seeing differences. So asking all those things about your name, um, trying to use different variations of your name because folks are trying to figure out your ethnicity or race, you know, really, those are the kind of things that you do when you're about nine or 10 years old in order to place yourself in the world uh, and, and position yourself against others and other people, other groups. Right. Mm-hmm. So they seem like they're the they seem like they're like, you know, negative or archaic or totally annoying to people who have any kind of relationship to folks from those groups. But really, it's just a very childish way of trying to figure out that person's place in the world. The problem is when that kind of stuff translates into discrimination or when it doesn't allow people to go beyond what they already know. So if I was going to teach nine-year-olds about race in the United States or African-Americans, I'd explain those kind of things, the kind of actual um, diversity training type things about how, you know, we're all together. We are actually all human beings. However, things that happened a long time before we were born are embedded in our society that make it unfair for others. And it's our job to overcome those kind of um, stereotypes or thoughts or memes in society in order to make sure that the reality of us all having equality becomes a a true reality. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, going back to, if you, if you're, if you're going to explain complicated archeology span thoughts and you think that because you're in the journal of um, archeology span sciences or something like that, that using very complicated words or, (laughs) If you're trying to explain this to descendant communities and you think that you're going to use your college degree or complicated words to get it past them, you're missing the entire point. You're trying to convey the information that you just got, and you need to make sure that it's available to anyone who could possibly figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why these kind of complicated physics journals, nobody's actually really reading them besides physicists. That's the reason why nobody gives a rip about half the articles we write in academic journals, including our own students peers and everybody else because they're written in the worst possible language 
and make it difficult for them to understand what exactly we're trying to say. Yeah. And that's, that's the reason clients don't read our reports either. I mean, those reports are written and paid for. They're written for and they're paid for by our clients, but we don't actually write them for our clients uh, from a CRM standpoint. We write them for ourselves. You know, we write them for the BLM. We write them for whoever the controlling agency is because they understand what we're saying. Um, you know, and that's a, a, another reason the clients just look at the management summary and say, can I dig? Can I not dig? You know, can I destroy that site? Can I not destroy that site? That's really all they care about. But maybe they would read a little more into it if we made it readable for them. You know, and I don't mean dumb it down, but at least make it a little less jargony. And it's all about your audience. You know, it's all about who your audience is. And that's what we were talking about with the code switching too, is, you know, if you're you have to make those decisions on your own. If you're going into an interview and you speak in a certain way, it's up to you to continue speaking in that certain way. And and if your interviewer doesn't want to hire you because you have a certain inflection in your voice or you have a certain you know way that you speak, well, then you decide whether or not you want to work for that person because they're going to judge you based on that. Or if you really do want to get the job and you don't care about it, you know, then you might switch up the way you speak. I don't know. Um, but we're going to end this discussion right now. I'd love to continue this on Facebook, Archeo Field Techs. I'm sure we'll get some more comments and as this discussion develops and unfolds. Um, come back in two weeks for episode 87, where we're going to talk about health and safety and and uh, find out what you can do if you get the, the Zika virus or, um, or some other horrible disease in the field while working. Actually, not what you can do, but how quickly you'll die. So we'll talk about that next time <laughs> on the CRM Archaeology Podcast. <laughs>